I'm going to go ahead and get started. We are so happy to have Jackie here today. We are lucky to um, be able to speak with Jackie because she knows so much about walking. And as I said, we're about to embark on this challenge. So what a better time to learn all this stuff so we don't get out there and hurt ourselves and we're doing it the right way when we do it. So Jackie is a fitness instructor and master coach. She has worked in the natural health, nutrition and fitness industries for the past 29 years. She is a certified Nordic walking trainer and coach and also a yoga instructor and instructor trainer. She opened Moving with Jackie, which is a business that provides yoga and Nordic walking education and community movement based opportunities. So she has classes, does consultations and trainings, and she can teach adults of all ages, shapes, sizes, and fitness levels. Her passion is lifestyle wellness, and her philosophy is being active at any size. So thank you, Jackie, so much for being here today. Welcome. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I, when I was asked to do this, I thought that I would take the perspective of an absolute beginner, somebody who's literally just been at the desk, been at, on the couch, and is deciding to um, start walking for fitness and enjoyment and build upon that. And so it starts off pretty rudimentary, and then I will build and, and add um, more as, as our time together uh, progresses today. And so if we can go to the next slide. To, um, to get started dressing for the environment, a lot of this may seem obvious to some, and maybe there's an item or two here that makes you think, oh, I didn't think of that. So um, bear with me as we just kind of move through it. Um, sun protection. Um, I think that oftentimes I have clients who think, well, I'm just gonna be out there for 15 or 20 minutes, you know, to start with. And that may be true, but perhaps uh, medication or something causes you to be a little bit more sensitive to the sun than, than normal. So making sure that you use good sun protection for yourself uh, is a good idea. Wearing a hat, um, long pants or shorts. Well, it depends on where you're walking. Um, obviously what the temperature is, but, also, are you walking on pavement? Are you walking in the grass or in, in the woods? Um, there's low brush and weeds that might need to be taken into consideration, um, as well as uh, things like ticks or snakes. So making sure that wherever you choose to walk, you allow your clothing to reflect appropriate protection. Um, wearing layers. If you're going out for a longer walk, especially, maybe you are going to be heading out early when the temperatures are cool and you need a light jacket, or um, perhaps you start off in the late uh, afternoon or early evening and it's going to cool down while you're walking, being able to have something to, to adjust your comfort level is a good idea. Also, if you live someplace where you have changing weather, um, such as, you know, weather fronts that come in if you're by the coast or um, if you're heading out and there is a weather change that's heading your direction, it's nice to know that um, you have a jacket to, to put on. And the other point there is to know, <laughs> to know if you're heading outside with a weather change um, that is approaching. Gloves, um, we think of gloves for warmth, but if you are someone who likes to walk with poles, which I will um, touch on in a little, in a little bit, uh, gloves can also be a, um, uh, a protective layer to, against friction from gloves or sweat. Uh, if you get very sweaty palms, sometimes having um, just an, a moisture wicking type of glove um, can add comfort to your hands. And then shoes. I'm gonna go ahead and ask you for the next slide here. So very often 
um, I find that people wear their fitness shoes too long. Um, I can tell you that I have clients as well as my mother who will replace their shoes when the tops look like they need to be replaced, when they're not so pretty anymore. And the tops are the least of our concern. So when you're wearing a shoe for fitness, um, my suggestion is to wear it specifically for fitness, specifically for the purpose that, um, that you uh, purchased them for. So if you like to wear um, a sneaker, gym shoe kind of shoe on an everyday basis, that's great. But if you're gonna be using shoes for fitness, perhaps a separate pair. Um, fitness shoes are really good um, for about three to 500 miles. And so this slide shows us an, a generalization that if you walk 45 to 60 minutes, three times a week, that's, that's a, for some people, we're talking about three miles or so um, every, you know, three times a week. You're looking at replacing your shoes about every five months. If you're walking that same 45 to 60 minutes, uh, three time, uh, four times a week, you're looking at replacing your shoes about every four months. And of course, five times a week, you're looking at getting new shoes every three months. And I think I said that upside down, I apologize, but the slide is correct. Um, the footbed of the shoe is made of foam and it's made of different layers of different types of foam. And some of those foam, the purpose, some of that foam, the purpose is comfort. And some of that foam, the purpose is support and some of it is, it, the purpose is protection. And the densities and the materials used for making those layers um, are all different and they break down at different rates. Your body weight, friction, heat, moisture, all of those things added up together. The foot bed, which is what is most important to us as walkers, is the first thing to go. So the shoe may look good, it may feel good, and it may not have the substantive support that you're asking it for. And so do replace your shoes frequently enough. And we can go to the next slide, please. So before heading outside, um, some things to take, just little tidbits here, are um, medications. So if, you're, if you haven't been participating in fitness for a while and you take medication, and even if you've been taking it for a while and you're accustomed to it, you may not be prepared for the behavior of that medication in your system when you add fitness. So I always suggest that um, People check with their doctors, their medical professionals before beginning any type of fitness or exercise program. And also having a good understanding of how does your medication behave in sun? There are some that cause um, uh, sun sensitivities, uh, it causes you to become bright red, or it may cause you to become um, additionally susceptible to sunburn. Uh, so no know the effects of your medication under the circumstances of fitness. And the next one, sweet or floral body sprays may seem kind of silly to be there, but uh, some of these um, body sprays that are floral or um, have some sort of a sweet note to them can attract insects, which I think most of us would agree is not really desirable. Uh, but also the makeup of those sprays can mix with your sweat and can really start to smell pretty unpleasant. And that would be unexpected. So um, just be aware of what you're putting on your body and why. And so when you're going to go out for a fitness walk, 
Um, you can decide whether or not you want that to be a part of your routine. Um, if you are someone who has a sensitivity to um, bug bites, you might want to be wearing um, some sort of a bug repellent. Um, and you can look into what meets your needs and what characteristics it's offered. Some people really don't like DEET. Some people swear by it. You know, do your homework um, and use something that you feel good about and that works for you. Um, hazards. Some hazards also may uh, be obvious and may be like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. But animals out on the loose, you know, people who let their, their dogs off leash could come running up to you. Um, stray uh, animals. If you're walking down by the, um, by the river on, you know, here in, in our area, we have um, a bike trail that goes along the American River. And there's a lot of uh, uh, wildlife down there. Um, and so consider whether or not you need something with you for protection. Um, if you live up in the mountains, do you wanna have bear spray with you or a bear bell? with you. Um, um, knowing about moving vehicles, again, using the example of our bike trail here on the American River is uh, knowing whether or not there are cyclists. They, the cyclists go very, very fast. And while the bike trail is made for walkers, joggers, cyclists, everybody is welcome there. Um, as walkers, we have the ability to step off the path more so than a cyclist has the ability to avoid us. So the rule of thumb for walking is the opposite from what we're um, used to in driving. In driving, we say, you know, here in the US, we say, stay on the right. Um, for walking, we wanna be on the left. We want to see what's coming towards us. We have the ability to step off one step to the left and we're out of the way. Um, if we're on the right, we're depending on hearing someone come up from behind us or hearing someone say, you know, behind you or excuse me, or sometimes they're not that polite. So the etiquette for walkers is to walk on the left and be prepared to step off to the left to get out of the way of, of something that is oncoming. Taking an action, a step or two even, before you normally would, lets the other individual understand that they're seen and know exactly what you plan to do so that they're not trying to second guess your actions in which case you might both head in the same direction at the same time. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So um, definitely on a trail, um, yield, you know, we're the walkers and we actually should yield the right of way to the, um, the cyclists that can't respond uh, as well as we can. And that's just a safety thing. Um, also, if you're walking just in urban areas, being aware of, are you in a high traffic area? Are you visible? Um, are you crossing at a light or in a crosswalk? Are you, you know, cutting across real quick to save yourself some effort? Being mindful of that as a walker, um, there are other entities, vehicles um, that are trying to share your space and letting yourself be seen and known of uh, would be very important. Also, when we're talking about hazards, being aware of where you're heading out to, if you're gonna, like for instance, here in Sacramento, um, if you enjoy walking around the Capitol and up and down Capitol Mall and around the gardens, um, it's so nice, but it would be nice to know if there was a big event. And um, sometimes it's obvious because you see everything that's going on around you, but perhaps you're starting from farther away and you've arrived you know, down in the vicinity, the capital, only to learn that there's a massive event or protest or some sort of affair. And that affects your ability to walk in the fashion that you were planning on. So it might mean that you would change your route. So, uh, 
choose your, your path knowingly. Be aware of, your, of the weather and weather changes. Be aware if there's an event or special circumstance happening in the area that you're planning on going to. Um, and just have an awareness around you. And lastly, under um, be mindful, taking that moment to take a deep breath, being present and um, checking in with yourself and saying, how am I feeling today? Um, are you prepared to take on this walk, to enjoy it, to um, enjoy your surroundings and deciding how much time you have for this walk and giving yourself the full amount of time so that you don't find yourself preoccupied or worried about the time. So taking that moment to just take a deep breath, become present, be aware of time restraints that you have, maybe set an alarm on a phone or a watch and um, allow yourself to just kind of, sounds like I'm teaching my, my yoga class, but sink into this activity of choice and allow yourself the full enjoyment of it. If you're wrapped up in other parts of your day, a walk can really help you separate from it. Um, and it, at the same time, while the walk may be the vehicle to help you deal with some of the stress from the other parts of your day, the stress from the other parts of your day can also uh, interfere with your presence in your walk. And that's where that, that just awareness, that mindfulness, being present and making some decisions based on the reality and truth of what is within you and that time when you're going to go and um, begin your walk. And you can ask yourself, you know, what can I let go of right now? What preconceived ideas, notions, or, um, uh, feelings can I let go of and move forward in a positive way? Next slide, please. So um, talking about equipment, um, some of this is um, geared more towards long walk. Some of it is geared more to towards um, uh, shorter walks. So. Um, to having something to hold your wallet, your keys, um, your phone uh, on a short walk, something like a hip pack, or I wear yoga pants that have a pocket and that, that's fine. Um, depending on how long of a walk and what the water, what the water, what the weather is, whether you want to take water with you, um, have, have the ability to take those things with you. Um, backpack, longer walks and hikes. You're gonna want the same things with you as you do on a short walk, but you might want a little bit more. Um, here I've listed uh, additional water, snacks, um, sunscreen for a second application, additional layers and such. So um, that's, again, decide how long you're gonna be out there and where you're gonna be. Next slide, please. So um, water bottle, water. Depending on how long you're gonna be out walking, um, you can decide how, how heavy of a water bottle. I love drinking out of glass. Glass weighs a lot, that's a lot to carry. Um, so what kind of container uh, if you need, if you're going to go out on a long walk um, or even a hike, you might want to consider something like a Camelback uh, backpack that has a water bladder in it and a little hose that comes up that um, either sits on your shoulder or you can leave it in your mouth, whatever you like. Um, it holds um, one to two liters of water. Um, so it really just depends on how long and where you're going to be. Visibility enhancements are things like reflectorized vests, tape, um, wrist or ankle straps. They now have reflectorized clothing um, where the, the shirt itself or the pants itself 
have some light reflection woven into the fabric, making you more visible. Um, flashing lights, you can wear them on your wrists, um, ankles, um, or on your head, making sure that you're visible. Just leaving it, if you're out in the evenings, just leaving it to somebody else's headlights to see you. Think about the last time you were um, driving and you didn't see someone till the very last minute and how uh, jarring that is. And make sure that you make yourself as visible as possible. Um, headphones and speakers are great because I listen to uh, books and music and, and such all the time. Uh, using only one, only um, cover one ear while you're out walking have the other ear available to hear what's going on around you. Um, also, while you're walking, there are some individuals, not everybody, but some people can have a little bit of um, a balance issue when they have both ears covered. So um, just know yourself, be aware, uh, and just for safety reasons, don't cover both of your ears. And next slide, please. So here we have a picture of a happy couple walking with walking sticks. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and progress to the next slide. And in these photos, the couple on the far left are walking on relatively smooth and flat surface and that would be um, Nordic walking. The couple in the middle are using trekking poles and they are on uneven, um, rocky terrain, um, usually off-road, often hiking, but it can also be walking. Um, and then on the far right, the drawing, we see both Nordic walking poles and hiking poles and the, the difference uh, for the most part is your terrain, but the poles themselves have differences. And um, I can just run off a few quick differences, like um, using the sticks, sometimes they're beautiful and they're carved and it's just, they're just gorgeous, but they're used in one hand. You use one stick when you're walking. It causes you to be slightly off balance the stick itself is often heavy, and um, some have a, a kind of a lanyard type leash attached to it, and some don't. So you're carrying um, that stick the entire way. Uh, if you have a beautiful walking stick and you're fond of it, enjoy it. Um, if you don't, you might want to consider something like a Nordic pole or a trekking pole, depending on where you do the majority of your walking. If you enjoy being off-road in uneven service surfaces on rocky or um, mountainous types of terrain most of the time, then a trekking pole would be appropriate for you and vice versa. If you're mostly on smooth, flat surfaces, um, a Nordic pole would be best for you. Nordic poles are lighter, they have handles that attach the pole to your hand so you're not carrying it. There are techniques involved in using both Nordic and trekking poles um, that can be learned. And um, using a Nordic pole for walking, you have a 40% increase in the amount of muscles that are being used for the same activity as walking without the poles. So you have a lower perceived um, uh, experience, um, lower perceived exertion than walking <clears throat> without the poles. And um, there is a, a chance that sometime in the future I will be talking specifically about using poles for um, fitness walking and trekking. Um, but if anybody has any questions, you're always welcome to uh, communicate with me. Um, all of my information is available um, here at the end and on the website. 
let's see, trekking poles. They have a swing weight to help you through low brush and weeds. Um, there's a simple loop strap uh, so that the pole can be somewhat connected to you. Won't, you won't necessarily drop it on the ground, but it's also not connected to your hand in the same way. So it's not there to call upon as immediately as a Nordic walking pole is. Um, there, because of the swing weight, it's, it can be slightly heavier. Um, both, uh, both types, all three types of poles help with stability and helps with uprighting your posture, the Nordic and the trekking poles much more so than a walking stick. Um, but those are just some of the benefits as to using poles versus not. And we can go to the next slide, please. So um, hydration, we, are, we talked a little bit about the, the water bottle. Um, and I think the question here is more about what does hydration do for you? And um, the benefits are of water is that it regulates your body temperature, it lubricates your joints, uh, it helps to transport nutrients, um, it also helps to flush toxins and waste out of um, your system. When we walk and, and exercise in any sort of way, our muscles produce lactic acid. And a buildup of lactic acid, overly simplified, of course, um, can add to tightness um, and discomfort in muscles. So we want to flush that lactic acid out as much as possible. And that's where um, cool downs and stretching come in, as well as drinking plenty of water. Uh, I have a, a link here. I also posted this link on the Facebook page because it's a fabulous uh, article that talks about water and the calculator about how much you want to drink and how to determine that. Um, and it's not a uh, all wordy and technical. It's a it's a quick read, and just gets you right to that information pretty quickly. So if you want to take a look at that, it could give you additional information um, about hydration. And I also want to mention that if you're not um, hydrated, you may feel tired. You may have muscle cramps and dizziness, and there's other symptoms. Um, severe dehydration can begin to affect um, liver and kidneys. Uh, it can be very serious. So uh, making sure that you're not taking your hydration for granted uh, is my point. So we can go to the next slide. Whenever you endeavor in a, in a fitness activity, I think we've all heard that you need to warm up. Um, but if you're walking, how do you warm up for walking? You allow yourself that first five to 10 minutes to take it slow. Allow your body to build um, warmth, to build circulation, and to begin to raise your um, heart rate. And you wanna do that in a nice, controlled, slow way, a progressive way. And so we do that by warming up for five to 10 minutes. Start off slow. Um, some people will even pause <clears throat> after that five to 10 minute mark and do a little stretching, which we will talk on in a few moments. And it prepares um, your, your body for aerobic activity. It helps to reduce muscle soreness and lessens your risk of injury. Um, increases blood flow to your muscles. We can go to the next slide. Cooling down. Um, cooling down is again, walking slowly for five to 10 minutes. It's very important. Um, cooling down allows your body to begin to recover, bringing your heart rate and blood pressure back down to your pre-exercise rate. Um, stopping a fitness activity when your heart rate is still elevated and you're still hot, hot and you just stop abruptly, um, it, that's hard on your system. It's um, skipping that transition period uh, is something that 
there's no perceived um, experience that says, oh, I skipped my cool down in that immediate moment. But understanding that what's going on inside your body is every bit as important as what you feel on the outside and giving your heart rate and uh, blood pressure that chance to come down in a gradual way is, is very worthwhile and beneficial. Um, next slide, please. And that brings us to stretching. Stretching is best done when your muscles are warm. So stretching before you begin to warm up, um, you're gonna be stretching cold muscles. You're, you're gonna be, you may find yourself desiring to bounce into those stretches because there's just not, not a whole lot of elasticity there yet. And bouncing is very, very counterproductive. Um, so I, I would never uh, recommend bouncing. So wait until you've done a little bit of, of a warm up and go ahead and do some stretching if you desire to. Um, stre uh, stretching strengthens the brain body connection. Um, we build neural pathways by learning new things and by practicing um, and repetition. And neuroplasticity is something that we lose with age. It's something that is affected um, with aging. And so as we age, doing things that help us learn something new, learning a new language, starting a new um, exercise routine, um, doing something that you do often, but doing it in a different way. These are all ways of exercising um, that brain body connection and helps to um, exercise that neuroplasticity that's um, very strong, strongly desired. Sorry about that. Um, it also, stretching also decreases the risk of injury. It can reduce stress. Um, and it can help you experience a better workout. Some people experience that. Next slide, please. Um, improving flexibility and range of motion. Uh, I think that it's during stretching that you may have that presence of mind to notice that you have um, achieved something. Oh, I can touch my toes now or oh, I used to struggle with that and now it feels easier. It's a great opportunity to get to know um, how you're doing. Uh, stretching definitely improves uh, blood circulation and helps move the lactic acid through the body, which I mentioned a few moments ago about water is the movement itself helps to move uh, the lactic acid, which is the byproduct being produced by your muscles. And then the water can help to flush it through. Um, lactic acid is, is moved through the bloodstream and um, staying well hydrated is what's gonna help to um, flush that through your system. Um, stretching also helps to improve muscular coordination. Um, that's again through that uh, brain body connection. Next slide, please. I'm adding the how to stretch here because when I was first taught to stretch back in school, we were taught specifically to bounce, come into a stretch and bounce that for um, 30 seconds to a minute. And, you know, here we are all these, these years later and science now tells us that we're tearing a lot of microfibers in bouncing. And so now the idea is to come into a stretch, feel the, t the tension that's created in your muscles, come to a place where you feel that tension, but not too much. You wanna experience it, but not force it. Hold that stretch for three to five breaths. And then slowly take a deep breath, come out of your stretch and move on to the next stretch. If you feel pain in a stretch, please stop. Pain in stretching is an indicator that something's not right. So um, investigate that with a healthcare professional and see what is causing that pain. 
Next slide, please. So now, since we're using walking as a fitness modality, um, and especially with the walk challenge coming up, there's many ways of measuring how we're doing on our walk. There's steps, there's miles, there's time. And um, some of us are using uh, like uh, Fitbits or um, some sort of a, a fitness watch or we're measuring on our um, phones and we're measuring distance or measuring um, steps or time and all three of those things are important at some point. Some people really just want to walk for 15 minutes. They just want to be out there for 45 or an hour. That's fine. If you are participating in a challenge where you have to re report or record information, obviously you need a means of doing so. And so having a measuring design device is important. But there are some other ways of measuring if keeping track is of less importance. And that would be perceived level of exertion. That would be uh, while you're out walking, can you hold a conversation? I would hope so. You should be able to talk while you're walking. If you could sing, you're probably not working hard enough probably step up your pace um, just a little bit more and work just a little bit harder. Uh, and using perceived level of exertion as a measuring tool is, is just that. Well, today I went for my walk and I was working hard enough to talk, but I don't think I could sing. And I walked around the block and I did that in less time than it took me yesterday. Or I made it further to the end of the park or um, I'm gonna walk from here until, um, you know, from point A to point B. And what was my experience in getting from point A to point B? And so having that, that awareness um, about you, whether it's perceived exertion, whether it's the number of steps it took you to get there, whether it's the time it took you to get there, or whether it's the distance that you traveled in the time that you were allotting yourself. Those are all different ways of, of having an awareness and being able to measure progression. Now, walking faster but still walking, again, definitely speaks to perceived levels of exertion. Um, but it also means walk, going from walking at one pace to walking in a, at another pace. And when I teach walking, when people decide that they would like to start walking faster, the first thing they do is they bend over somewhat around their waist and they start really, you know, they're pumping their arms and they're trying to almost jog, but not quite jog. And that's when they say, oh, that hurts. <laughs> and for all you runners out there, I'm sorry, I'm not making generalizations. I'm talking about walkers, beginners, um, to, to go from a walk to a run often does not feel very good. So um, there's another way to approach getting your walk to be a little faster. And uh, if you could picture for a moment um, a clown in, in, in your mind's eye, and the clown has the great big shoes, and they are capable of leaning very far forward in an unnatural way because of those great big shoes. Well, that is a hinge. They are hinging forward at their ankles. Their knees aren't bent, their hips are not bent, their waist is not bent. They're hinging from their ankles. And I would like to suggest that you do something very similar. If all you did from an upright standing position is draw your chest forward an inch, inch and a half off center, 
your body is going to want to correct your center of gravity. And that usually happens in the form of taking a quick step. Your brain is trying to right yourself. So if you hold yourself in that forward direction, again, the hinge is happening ankle um, uh, level, not higher. You're not bending at the waist. And you just maintain that, that forward draw of your torso, you're going to see your walking pace increase. So that's happening, or um, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're changing the shape, you're changing the center of gravity, and your body is meeting you in that change. And that's very sustainable. Bending forward and trying to make yourself go faster often is not sustainable. Either something begins to hurt or you can only do that for so long before something begins to hurt. So these, again, this is another technique I'm happy, happy to talk more about with you um, if anybody is interested, but you can play with that. And, and see how it feels. I, I caution small movements to see how uh, it works for you. I would not want somebody to lean very far forward and put themselves at risk for falling. So um, stay within your own comfort level and then experiment with expanding your comfort level. Next slide, please. So now we're going to come to posture, and I am going to challenge some of what we've been taught as norms. Um, I can speak for myself. Um, as a mature woman, I've been taught my whole life in gym classes, in dance classes, in um, when I'm being taught about posture, I have been taught to tuck my tailbone as a means of making my posture long and tall. And that is not a good idea. <laughs> um, specifically within the world of fitness, tucking your tailbone straightens out um, the lower curve of your body, the lordotic curve of your spine. And that is our first, um, not first, it, it is a form of uh, um, shock absorption to our body. That's why we have curves in our body is for shock absorption amid many other reasons. And taking one of those curves away is, means that some other part of your body is going to have to uh, uh, make up the difference, usually in the form of pain. So the, if you were looking at somebody from a side view, their lower back or sacrum, which is from their tailbone, to the top of their pelvis should be sitting at about a 30 degree angle. Um, if your sacrum is more towards up and down, chances are you're tucking your tailbone and it's out of habit and you don't even know that you're doing it. And um, I, I, in another class at another time, I can teach you or show you how to double check that for yourself. But if you could just be aware that you don't wanna tuck your tailbone Think of your pelvis as a fishbowl, and we want the fishbowl to be slightly tilted forward so that the water in the fishbowl would spill out in the front of your body um, just slightly. And that's enhancing the, um, the tilt of the pelvis, and uh, you would not be able to pour the water out of the fishbowl in a forward fashion if you were tucking your tailbone. Um, I also hear people talk about how after they've been walking for a little while, their low back starts to hurt. And um, more often than not, because I don't know your history, I don't know what's going on with your body, if you have a history of something or disc um, degeneration or any other number of things, I would just say that in a general sense, most people experience low back pain in walking because they are not engaging their abdominal muscles. And I'm not talking about engaging them hard and firm and, and 
you know, where you can barely breathe. I'm talking about just pulling your belly button in towards your spine just a little bit. It's just an activation of those muscles. And most of the time when people are walking with me and they say, my lower back is starting to hurt and I um, ask them to engage their abdominal muscles, the low back pain more often than not will ease or go away completely. So the abdominal muscles are, they create a girdle that supports our torso, the middle part of our, of our body. And it's like that, it's like a big wrap around and it's supporting the organs and the muscles and the bones and everything else in addition to our bones that are structurally supporting us. So engaging those abdominal muscles is a way of um, easing and supporting your low back. Walking with good posture, standing up straight, which would translate to your chin being level. You don't wanna be looking down and you don't need to be looking up, just chin level, your eyes are focused about 10 paces ahead of you. Um, your spine is drawn long and tall. Your tailbone is not tucked and you are striking the ground with your heel, rolling through the length of your foot onto the ball of your foot, bending your toes and pushing off with the ball of your foot. And if you become more aware of this type of posture and technique of walking, you can then add in noticing, are your feet splaying out or are your toes pointing forward. Um, years go by and we begin, we uh, uh, take on habits that we don't even know that we have. And so walking is a wonderful opportunity to do that check in in your whole body to find out, well, what am I doing? I'm feeling this on my big toe a lot. And um, If you're feeling it on your big toe or if you're feeling it on the outside of your little toe, you may want to ask yourself, what part of my foot um, is being used most often and what can I do to bring it back to uh, um, a neutral position? Next slide, please. Adding intensity. When we're walking, some people have, have commented to me about, well, if I wanna add intensity to a walk, doesn't that mean that I'm running? It's not. We can add intensity and still remain walking. So one way is intervals. Intervals can be as easy as saying, I'm, I'm walking around this park and this park has is rectangular and it has two long sides and two short sides. And so I am going to walk alongside. And when I come to the, the short side of the park, I'm gonna walk drawing my chest forward and I'm gonna put full effort and intensity into my walk. And I'm gonna maintain that for this short edge of the park. And when I get to the next corner and I'm going to begin a, a long edge of the park, I'm going to reduce my speed, reduce my intensity, and come back down to my normal walking rate and recover. Let my heart rate come back down and walk that. When I come to the opposite corner and another short end of the park, I'm gonna push up the intensity and maintain that the whole time for the short end of the park. That's one example of how you can use an interval. There are many. Um, you can change your environment that you're walking in. Uh, if you typically walk around near your home and you're in a very flat area, perhaps you can go to another neighborhood that has hills. Imagine living in the valley and then going for a walk in San Francisco. It's going to be a very different experience. But there are some neighborhoods that are very close by to you that also have more hills 
than what your typical uh, route might have. So look for hills, look for opportunities to go up and down in some way. Maybe there's stairs, maybe there's um, uh, an area where you're going from a neighborhood, maybe going down closer to a river. There's, there's a, um, a slope there. Another way of adding intensity to walk is walking with your feet in water, like walking along a beach um, on sand. Walking on sand is hard work, but so is walking in water because your, water, your feet are pushing against the resistance of the water. Uh, and so investigate what changes can you make that are in your area or whether you want to have a day where you're gonna go and travel and walk a different environment. Um, adding weight. Uh, the science has shown over and over again that wrist and ankle weights are um, can be dangerous for many people. And it has to do with repetitive motion injuries and that having the weight be on our far extremities uh, is, is very taxing. Um, if you want to add weight, the best and safest way to add weight to walking is going to be using a weighted vest. The vest attaches onto your torso. You can control how much weight goes onto the vest, and that's going to be your safest bet. Um, I would avoid, unless you're working with a professional, like a trainer or um, a physical therapist that wants you to accomplish something very specific, I would avoid having weight be at the far end of your extremity. Next slide, please. I'm very pleased I did it in time. <laughs> so um, thank you for staying. Thank you for listening. Um, like I said, this in the beginning, this was geared towards that from, from zero to, to getting going, which I would call zero to hero uh, uh, perspective. Um, there is much more that can be discussed. If I've said anything that planted a seed for you and you want more information, please feel free to reach out to me. And um, I look forward to hearing from you. I, I think that there are some questions. I'm happy to take questions now. Everyone is commenting, thank you, and that it was excellent. Thank you so much, Jackie. I just have a question since we are beginning this challenge, which does start rather quickly. Do you have any advice about um, either ramping up, you know, how incrementally should we be, you know, 10% of time, 10, you know, from 2000 steps to 4,000 steps? Like, what does that look like for someone that's just starting? Right. So there are so many walking programs that are available online for free. You can just Google um, like couch to 5k. That's, that's an easy way of finding it. But for, on, for the most part, the suggestions that are made is to go from um, couch to 5k, which is 3.1 miles is, um, is about a six week progression. Um, and that's, that's really being very, very, very safe. Some of you are, are already fit and doing other activities that would allow you to go at a quicker pace and some don't need to, that you're not concerned with that. So the, what those do is they, it has you work um, three days a week at something that has to, to do with your, uh, your capability. So if, if walking for 10 minutes is of no consequence to you, no pain, you're not working very hard, it's not difficult, try 15, try 20. When you start to feel like there is the slightest amount of challenge, that's where you stay for a week. For three days a week, you are going to do that amount. Maybe that's 20 minutes of walking. If you're measuring your steps, measure the steps, but so be it. Don't challenge yourself with steps yet. Then on your second week, you're going to add one of your days. If you're working three days a week, then your third day, you're going to challenge yourself a little bit more. So if you've been walking 20 minutes for the first two days of the week, 
on the third day, you're gonna take it to 25, maybe even 30. You should feel like you've worked hard um, on that challenge day. Then you have your day of rest. When you come back next week and start your three day a week walk, or you know, this I'm using that just as an example, you're gonna take that um, 30 minute that you did as a challenge. That's now what you use as your two days and you're gonna challenge yourself with one day a week at the end for that week also. So you're just gonna push yourself and then you rest. And then you start over again at that next level up. Great, that was very helpful. And I, a question that I can relate to, is there a way to make walking the dog more challenging without changing the dog's behavior? So we're gonna <laughs> ask that question. And I will tell you, yes, the first 20 minutes of my walk with the dog is so slow in my mind before the dog really gets into that walk. So if you are walking without pulse, um, basically you're teaching your dog how to take your walk. So give your, give yourself and the dog a little bit of time to learn from each other that this is my fitness walk and this is what I expect from you. I understand you're going to poop and I'm going to have to stop and pick it up, but I want you to learn that I don't want you cr crisscrossing in front of me with the leash. I don't want you wrapping my legs with the leash. And um, if you give me, you know, 10 minutes of solid walking, I'm gonna give you a few minutes of sniffing and, and you know, adventure. So you're gonna have to work with, with your pet. Some people have much more, um, trained animals than, than others. And just look at it that you have, you have to teach one another how to go on this fitness walk. That's a very good answer. I love that. Um, okay. Does anybody else have any questions that aren't in the chat? You can unmike yourself. You can ask if not, I did place in the chat that Jackie will be doing a guided walk. Um, for us, August 3rd, there will be more details to come and she'll go over more of this stuff actually as we're walking. So we can experience some of these posture corrections and pace intervals, breathing, all of that. And we will also bring Jackie back to talk about Nordic walking, which I'm very fascinated to learn about. So we will find a time for her to come back to talk to us um, as well for Nordic walking. And somebody did put in the chat, I want, you might want to consider using a portable cart or a stroller if you have an older dog. Yes, because then you would obviously control that pace, which is a great tip. Yeah. So it looks like that might be it. Thank you, Jackie, so much. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And hopefully we'll see you guys in our challenge and we'll see you when Jackie guides us through our walk uh, in a couple of weeks. Could I ask a question about the, uh, okay. just the housekeeping question about how you report your mileage to the challenge or is that going to be? Explained? Yeah, so it's done through which if you go on our website, there is it's done through an app, the big team challenge, which will sync with your Apple like watch or your phone pedometer or your Fitbit. It, the app will do all of that. You just link it. It's there are instructions and videos online. So it's, if you have any yeah. questions, feel free to email us, but yep, your Fitbit, it'll does it all for you. Right. Um, and so that will start August 1st. So just get signed up. Do you have a team, Donna? Yes. Okay. I awesome. The fearsome five or something like that. Great. So, uh, yeah. So if you go into your um, app, you'll see a way that it says like sync device or something like that, and it'll sync to your Fitbit. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thank you all. We'll see you all soon. Thank you, Jackie. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.